Welcome to Brother Miller's Notes as we focus today on 2 Kings chapter 17 through 25. We're going to cover a lot of history today, but in a very brief manner. Our focus really is going to be on the power of the scriptures. Reading Revelation invites Revelation into our minds and in our hearts. We're going to see that today. How Revelation is, is received and how it also invites wickedness to leave our minds and our hearts. We're also going to focus on how you can make a difference today. How you can make a difference to others to help them be inspired and inspiring. First and Second Kings covers 400 years of the growth and then the decay of the kingdom. Now I know it starts as one kingdom and ends as two kingdoms. Well, let me rephrase that. It starts as one kingdom and ends as zero kingdoms because both of them are taken over. So it begins with King David, ends with the king of Babylon. It opens with the building of the temple and ends with the burning of the temple. It opens with David's first successor, Solomon, who's going to be building the temple. It ends with the last uh, successor to Solomon, or to David, Jehoiakim. He's released from captivity by the king of Babylon. First Kings, major story PR guy is Elijah. Second Kings, major PR goes to Elisha. They're the positive bright spots here. Now there's some others. We'll get to some of them today. Now here's a picture of what the kingdoms would look like as we start our study in the Come Follow Me curriculum. Northern Kingdom of Israel, you got it there, Southern Kingdom. By the end of our time together, the Northern Kingdom will be captured by Assyria and the Southern Kingdom by Babylon. We cover a, the reign of many kings. And you can just see the list here. And maybe some characteristics. You look on the right hand side, Israel, their kings, their character, it's just bad. They try to do themselves bad. You got some prophets that are in the northern kingdom. You see on the southern side, you see their character. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. You got your prophets there. So we'll be focusing on Elisha still. He'll pass away in the first couple chapters we study. And then we have the uh, influence of Isaiah is heavily through what we'll be studying today. So we start off 2 Kings 8. And then, and I'm just kind of going through, this is 2 Kings 9, we're bouncing back and forth from the southern tribe to the northern tribe. And we go back to the southern tribe in chapter 11, chapter 12, we get uh, southern kingdom. And then chapter 13, Elisha dies, and we cover a couple kings from the northern tribes. Then we're back to the southern kingdom in chapter 14. And then chapter 15, we stay in the southern kingdom. And then you get like this phrase in chapter 15, there's many kings, and it just kind of goes through them. And it just write down this list until they are captured by Assyria, the northern kingdom. Chapter 15, it just says, many kings reign in Israel and in Judah. Their wickedness, wars, conspiracies, and evils are described. Much of Israel is carried away to Assyria by Tiglath-Pileser III. And so that's kind of the summary, and I think that's probably why we don't study a lot of that in the Come Follow Me curriculum is because that one chapter heading covers it. For the most part. But sometimes you just think, what did these kings fail to do? If they would have done just one thing that would have maybe changed the tide. There's a repeated phrase. When phrases are repeated in the scriptures, it catches my attention. 2 Kings 14, speaking of one king. The high places, now these are places that are devoted to the worship of false gods, were not taken away. They may want to do some things, they may want to make some changes, but they leave those high places, those places of worship of false gods, intact. And they just kind of say, okay, people keep going there. But they haven't addressed the root of the problem, false worship or idolatry. 2 Kings 15. Save, here's the accept. Ah, you know, the high places were not removed. It's like the, the author here is just saying, you got to remove this wickedness out or it's going to keep coming back. But the people are still there. Use your influence. In verse 35, how be it? The high places were not removed. Out of all these kings, you should be removing the wickedness out of your hand, land. The people sacrifice and burn incense still in the high places. And, but even though you're building the gates in the house of, of God. And then I just pause. Maybe there's a lesson. We want to do what's better, but... What results if we fail to remove the evil influences from our lives? If we have a challenge with maybe looking at, I don't know, maybe inappropriate materials, media, 
but you fail to remove that influence from your life. There's part of strengthening, there's part of changing behavior, there's part of prayer. I mean, there's a lot of things that can go into it. It's not one simple solution. But if you have a stack of pornography, get rid of it. That, that evil influence, just it's time and time again, you get rid of it, whatever it is. And then there's just this theme that's going to run through the rest, of day, the rest of our time together is the study of the scriptures make a difference. It'll change your mind. It'll change your heart. It'll change the way you think. It'll change the way you feel. The study of scriptures will inspire you in what to remove out of your life, what to stop, what to start doing, and what to continue doing. Well, I'm going to focus on a couple of kings for a minute. Ahaz is one of the worst kings ever. Verse 3, it says this about him. He walked in the way of the kings of Israel. Yea, he made his son pass through the fire, according to the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel. I'll go back. I'll just move this. You can see from this picture, that is a a picture of Ahaz offering his son as a sacrifice to a false god. And in this sacrifice, you know, behind the bot in the in the, in the uh, false god, they're putting a fire. And the idea is you give your son, and the son puts it out to the, heart, to the hands, and the son is consumed by fire. That's your sacrifice to this false god. And here's the way Ellis Rasmussen explained it. Ahaz was the worst of the Davidic kings. He had the great prophet Isaiah to advise him and would have done better by accepting his advice. The phrase, made his son pass through fire according to abominations of the heathen, does actually mean that he offered a son to the fire-belching idol. He also performed other idolatrous practices. Ignoring both Isaiah's assurance about an attack by Assyria, by Syria and Israel and his warning about the growing dangers from Assyria, Ahaz tried to pressure play against the Assyrians and northern Israelites by giving tribute to Assyria's king, even adopting his religion to curry favor with him. This Ahaz, a descendant of David and Solomon, even removed the lavers from the brass and the sea, or the font, from the brazen oxen of the temple to satisfy the king of Assyria. The Chronicles account expands the brief note about Ahaz's death to explain that he was buried in Jerusalem, but not in the sepulchres with the other kings. And now we introduce this year kind of one of those, uh, this is the global power and the bad guy who's just in the background with all of Isaiah. And when we get with Isaiah, we'll kind of talk about him. Ahaz sends messengers to Tiglath-Pasir, king of Assyria. He's really the third, saying, I am thy servant and thy son. Come up and save me out of the hands of the king of Assyria and out of the hands of the king of Israel, which rise up against me. Because they're trying to do the civil war. And really what Syria and Israel kind of region powers are trying to do is they're trying to force the southern kingdom to join them in a war against Assyria. And he's going behind their back. I don't want to join your little triumvirate to attack the world superpower. I don't, just not wise. Ahaz is afraid of Assyria and their power. And he has good reason to. Now I read verse 8. Uh, Ahaz took the silver and gold that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house, and sent it for a present to the king of Assyria. Let me buy your friendship. Because Assyria is a world power that has a domestic, or I mean international policy of terror. They're international terrorists by nature. That's what they've trained their army to do. Every year their kings go out, loot another kingdom, bring things back. And that's what they're doing now. And when they do that, you find that they broadcast it. They promote it. This is what they try and do. They say, well, not only did we do this to somebody else, if you don't conform, we're going to do this to you. And so if you go to the capital of Assyria and you're hanging out in the king's palace or just kind of, hey, I want to get a diplomatic little interview, meet with the king's messengers, there are reliefs all along the walls of how Assyria has creamed some nation. And when they cream them, they just don't them. They're brutal. They use tactics of terror. Check 2 Kings chapter 17. Then the king of Syria came up throughout all the land and went up to Samaria and besieged it three years. 
And in the ninth year, Hosea the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away into Assyria and placed them in Hala and Harbor by the river Gozon and in the cities of the Medes. And you can tell from this little picture. I'll just point out a couple things. Oh, I'm going to got to go back. Okay. Here's the siege coming up. You have the people who the, the Syrians are trying to overwhelm and they're pleading. You have other parts where, yeah, if you're a warrior, you're going down. Down below here where the scripture is, they're being brutal and they're executing this individual. They have put these people on pikes. They're always small figures. The Assyrian army is always big. They look awesome because we came in and kicked your rear ends. And then there's a deportation, a, a part of that. It's a purposeful de deportation. 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 24. And the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon and from Kuthath and from Ava and from Hamath and from Surfavrim and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they possessed Syria and dwelt in the cities thereof. In short, here's what they try and do. As they come in, and I don't know that thirds are the right quantities because it's very much dependent, but you got a lot of people that are killed. It's not quite that high. But then they take some of the best, the brightest, the, according to the needs of what they want. If you've got some really good blacksmiths, they're going to take them back to Syria and put them all over the place. And then that also opens up some of the best houses. And then they bring in people from Assyria and transplant them into there. What they're trying to do is mix up the cultures. They're trying to mix up the people. They're trying to make it one great culture, the culture of Assyria. As a historian Karen, Ray, Karen Rayner explained, the deportees, which labor and their abilities were extremely valuable to the Syrian states, and the relocation was carefully planned and organized. We must not imagine treks of destitute fugitives who were easy prey for famine and disease. The deportees were meant to travel as comfortably and as safely as possible in order to reach their destination in good physical shape. Whenever deportations were depicted in the serial imperial art, men, women, and children are shown traveling in groups often riding on vehicles or in animals, and never in bonds. There is no reason to doubt these deportations as a Syrian narrative. Art does not otherwise shy away from graphic displays of extreme violence. And contemporary text sources support the notion that these deportees were traveling well, as attested, for example, in a letter from an Assyrian official to his king, tiglath Pasir III. Here's what he says. As for the Armenians, whom the king my lord has written to me, prepare them for their journey. I shall give them their food supplies, clothes, a water skin, a pair of shoes, and oil. I do not have my donkeys yet, but once they are available, I will dispatch my convoy. Hey, king, I'm taking care of them. They're going to arrive in good condition. And continuing the quote, As we have seen, the Assyrian resettlement policy divided existing communities into those who had to stay and those who had to leave, according to the needs of the state. Populations were relocated within the boundaries of the empire, replacing and being replaced by people who were themselves moved. Our last source especially highlights that the state authorities actively encouraged a mixing of the new neighbors. The ultimate goal of the Assyrian resettlement policy was to create a homogeneous population with a shared culture and a common identity, that of the Assyrians. And as a side note, you get that also in the New Testament. And it's one of the big bad guys in the background where you have this Kind of, hey, let's all get along. Let's all worship one God. And if you have a different face on the God, great. Let's just all do the same thing. And the apostles write against that. Well, that's what Assyrians trying to do. And you have that later in the New Testament influence as well. So Kings chapter 17. Now, I got a lot of text up here, but just a couple high, high, highlights. The Lord says, after Assyria comes in and takes the northern kings captive, he says, let me tell you why you sinned against God. Here's what you did. You had statues. You did secretly things that weren't right. You put up, built up the high places with your false worship. Verse 10, you set up images and groves, and you burnt incense, verse 11, and you wrought, wrought, wrought wickedness. You acted on these things. And 12, you served idols. Yet, you've done all this. But the God's a God of second chances. He's keeping working with you. I'll read all of verse 14. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah and all the prophets and by all the seers saying, Turn ye from your evil ways 
and keep my commandments and my statutes according to the law which I have commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants the prophets. But, now we're back to the list of reasons why you were dispersed, ten tribes. You wouldn't hear, you harden your hearts, you harden your necks, and you don't believe in the Lord your God. You reject his statutes, you rejected the covenant, you rejected the testimonies. You've rejected everything and just followed after really what's in your selfishness, your vanity. You've become vain. You went after the heathen. You left the commandments of the Lord, verse 16. You made molten images. You made the grove. You served a false god. And you worshipped anyone else but me. And you caused your sons and daughters to do wickedness, and you caused them harm. Now, in this case, to pass through the fire, you're offering your sons and daughters as a sacrifice. And how bad can you get, really, right? Uh, you use divination enchantments. You're not going to the prophet. You're using these little sorcerers. And you sold yourselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord is very angry and removed him out of your sight. There's your punishment. And in that type of society, sometimes you have to wonder, can one righteous person make a difference? Even when it seems that it's going to be futile to struggle against wickedness. I mean, you apply it to you. Can you make a difference today? In your circumstances, maybe when you look around and you see the news and you see a tragedy or you just see just ickiness. Well, that's the character that we bring to count right now, Hezekiah. He starts with him. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. If you want to make a difference in life, start with you. Start with your heart and your actions. Do what's right in the sight of God. And as random thing, this is actually Hezekiah's seal. It was found in an ancient trash heap. Now, the impression bears the ancient Hebrew inscriptions belonging to the Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, as well as a two-winged sung and downturned wings, and two acna, the loop cross symbol of life. And it was found, as I've written there, unearthed in an ancient trash heap near the walls of the Temple Mount. So Hezekiah does three things that turns people to the Lord. First, he does things that just says, if there's evil among you, I'm going to get it out of there. I'm going to remove it. So chapter 18, verse 2, he removes the high places. And that's been a constant kind of reiterated statement, thought throughout 2 Kings. Get rid of these places of false worship. He break the images, cut down the groves. Now the next part, you may think this is a little bit out of character. Break into pieces the brass serpent that Moses had made. Now, I, I pause here for a minute. Moses made that brass serpent. And you may recall they put it up on a stick. If you'd look to it after a serpent flyering, or a fiery serpent had bitten you, you lived. If you didn't, you didn't live. Look to Christ and live. Don't look to Christ. Not so good for you. They kept the brass snake. And it's kind of a relic. Well, you have people at this time that, well, it's not that they are worshiping a false idol, but now they're worshiping a true relic. They're going to this, this brazen serpent and going, well, you know what? In the time of Moses, it healed people. Maybe if I go touch it. Maybe if I kind of do a little jig dance on it. And Hezekiah is saying, that's not it. You're missing the mark. This is something that keeps us, keeps us looking to Christ. And if you're going to start worshiping this, I'm just going to destroy it. I'm going to get rid of it. I'm not going to throw it away or someone's going to go try and find it. So that's what he does. He breaks into pieces, destroys it. And in those days, the children of Israel did burn incense to it. That's what they're doing to it, trying to worship it a little bit. So he removes the evil from them. He removed good things like the brazen serpent that were keeping Israel from the better or the best or the celestial from the Lord. He simply trusts in the Lord. And, you know, sometimes you wonder, is there things in our lives that are good? But maybe the good should be removed so it can make way for the better or best. And, and I just thought, well, what kind of things from my life do I see? And maybe it's okay to break a tradition that it's a tradition. Or you ignore, I know President Nelson would, wouldn't like me to say this, but Mormon culture. The gospel doctrine is not necessarily culture. There's difference. 
And it's okay to ignore and get rid of the culture. Focus on the doctrine. Even if it dates back to all the way when they're doing it in Nauvoo in the, in the presence of Joseph Smith. Now, Isaiah chapter 10 makes a prophecy. He prophesies that Assyria is going to come against the southern kingdom. He's going to start down, and Isaiah just says, he's going to come down from that north, and he just lists all these little cities, and he's going to come. And you just imagine, as Isaiah is listening, the flow of refugees coming towards Jerusalem with all their horror stories. And then Isaiah says, he's going to get all the way to Nob, right outside Jerusalem. He'll be there, shake his fist, I can see you tomorrow, it's your day. And God will save you. And so chapter 17, 18, verse 13, now the 14th year of King Isaiah, did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against all the fenced cities of Jerusalem, Judah, and took them. Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria to Lachish, saying, I have offended. Return from me, that which thou puttest on will I bear. And the king of Assyria appointed unto Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. And I pause here. What you see above there is a relief that I believe is in a museum in England, the British Museum. When Sennacherib comes down from Assyria and he starts taking all these cities, one of them is Lachish. That relief depicts the destruction of that city. There's nothing left there today. If you go there, it's a flat mound. He took that city out so well, there is nothing left and they never repopulate it. And if you see like parts, I'll show you a couple pictures, I just kind of zoomed in on this. He's brutal as he does it. And as they're doing it, Hezekiah just says, oops, hey, here's some gold, I'll pay tribute. And that's verse 14 and 15. Hezekiah, verse 15, gives him the silver, it's found in the house of the Lord and treasure of the kingdom. Um, and so left-hand side, you see the siege. This is Lachish. You see the right-hand side. That's the king just there on his throne watching it all happen. And then you have people coming up from his lieutenants and they're getting orders and he is, and, and there is a little inscription right above his head where he recounts, I came, I saw, I destroyed, everything is by me because I'm awesome. That's not really what he, it's kind of the thought though. Um, and in this, you can kind of see, now this is, this is a, a zoomed image. You can see the siege engines coming up. This is the tower and they're kind of fall. You people being impaled. You have these archers coming up. And the idea is, here's the story. Here's how we sieged it. And you have people who are being filleted alive. That's what's happening here. And you have these are people who are on their way captive. Notice they're just following each other. Uh, captive on the way out. You have pictures of families in here that are leaving out the front gate. And then Hezekiah does three more things in our count that further turns himself and his people to the Lord. In 2 Kings 19, the first thing he does is he makes sure and he goes to the temple. Then he seeks the counsel of the prophet, Isaiah. And he prays. He prays the Lord. And I thought, those are three great things that would help us today in our time of toil. This is a time of national toil. This is a time of national peril. And maybe sometimes we have that kind of peril in our lives or in our nations. But those three things can help us. Be in the temple. Seek the counsel of the prophet. And pray. And then maybe check up. How well are you doing in that? What are you doing really well? I think sometimes I ask that question, or should ask that question a little bit more. What are you doing well already? And then maybe how can you improve? Chapter 37, Hezekiah seeks counsel from Isaiah to save Jerusalem. Isaiah prophesies the defeat of the Assyrians and the death of Sennacherib. Hezekiah prays for deliverance. Sennacherib does send a blasphemous letter. Isaiah prophesies the Assyrians will be destroyed, and the remnant of Judah will flourish. An angel slays 185,000 Assyrians. Sennacherib goes home, he's in his temple, and as he's there, a couple of his sons come and beat him and kill him. Now, this is Isaiah chapter 37. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, and Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall you say unto your master, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words that thou hast heard, wherewith the servants of the king of Syria has blasphemed me. Behold, thou send a blast upon him. He shall hear a rumor and return to his own land. I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. 
I just wanted to share a couple things Isaiah said to Hezekiah. Hezekiah goes and seeks advice from the prophet. First thing, hey, here's what you need to say. Don't be afraid. And then there's a theme from 37, the next couple chapters, of reassurance from Isaiah. Things will be okay. Chapter 41, 10. Fear thou not, I am with thee. Be not dismayed. For I am thy God, I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. And in the Hebrew, that yea is an amplifier. I will strengthen thee. And indeed, I will help thee. And building on that, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. You see in what Hezekiah says, he starts to use phrases that the prophet Isaiah is using. There's power in using prophetic phrases. So here's Hezekiah's response. After he sought the prophet's inspiration, what's the Lord want? And then he goes out to people, and here's what he says. Now we're back to 2 Chronicles 32. I know we're all over the place here for just a minute. We'll get back to 2 Kings in just a minute. 2 Chronicles 32. He, Hezekiah, set captives of war over the people and gathered them together in the street and the city of the gate and spake comfortably to them. I love that. Calm, peaceful comfort. Because that's what Isaiah is telling him. He's just doing the same thing. Be strong and courageous. Be not afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor all the multitude that is in him, for there is more that we are with us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Isaiah is receiving it from the Lord. Hezekiah is receiving it from Isaiah. And the people are taking comfort that their leader is saying what the Lord is saying through the prophet. Boy, that's just great response. Now back to 2 Kings 19. The result of what happens? They do. The Assyrian army comes. They're only a few miles away. They're at Nob. Shake the fist. We get you tomorrow. Came to pass. Now it's 2 Kings 19, verse 35. That night, the angel of the Lord went out, smote in the camp of the Assyrians, 104 score and 5,000. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. So Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, departed and went and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. Came to pass while he was worshiping the house of Nishrash, his god, that Adramelech and Sharazar, Sharazes, or, uh, yeah, whatever, his son smote him with a sword, and they escaped to the land of Armenia. And Esher Hadon, his son, reigned in his stead. Now, for me, I'm just summarizing, these are just my thoughts on 2 Kings 19, how I apply them. There is power using prophetic words. They comfort, they encourage, they inspire. When we quote what our modern-day prophet is saying, it's what the Lord wants us to hear now. And I think there's just power in saying and taking emotional cues. you got the prophet saying things are going to work out. Things are going to work out. It's assuring, reassuring. If he says, hey, make a change here. Make, tell people, I need to make that change first, and we need to make that change. Hezekiah and Isaiah turned the people to the Lord in their time of need, a time of national peril. I think, how can we help others turn to the Lord in their time of need so that he can help them overcome their fears and challenges? That's the key. We turn the people to the Lord. I think that's just one of the great things that he did. Now, Hezekiah is asked, yeah, about ready to die, and his life is extended for a period of time. However, he makes a mistake in chap chapter 20 of 2 Kings. Babylon's ambassadors come by. Hey, let's visit. And Hezekiah goes in and says, Oh, I'm so glad you're here. This is so wonderful. Look at all the loot I have. I'm rich. Boy, Babylon ambassadors go back and go, They're rich. When we need money, let's go get it. And Isaiah, he immediately understands Hezekiah's um, faux pas here. Verse 16, And Isaiah says unto Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left, left saith the Lord. By the way, spoiler alert, in a couple minutes, that's where we're going to be. So, he dies. His son is Josiah. And, and he's just a good king. He does what's right, chapter 22, verse 2. He repairs the temple. 
and he reads in the scriptures. Matter of fact, when they repair the temple, they find the book of the law. Now, this is, this is going to be the first five books of the Old Testament. And they're like, oh, let's read it. And they start reading it. And he realizes as they're reading it, we are doing a lot of things that are wrong. So in chapter 22, verse 13, Go ye, inquire the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that's found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that's kindled against us, because our fathers have not hearkened to the words of this book, to do according to all which is written there and according to us. And then I love there's a bunch of if-then statements. If you inquire of the Lord, and you make sure your heart's tender, you humble yourself before the Lord, and you're doing outward signs. I mean, it's inward too, but it's outward. You rent your clothes. You're making sure everybody knows I've done wrong. And you're sincere. He's crying. He's weeping. Then there's the then. Got the green triangle on this. Then I'm going to hear you. I'm going to gather you to your fathers. Thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he catches that. You're going to be back in a place of righteousness. And you're going to have peace. And your eyes are not going to see evil that I'll bring being upon this place. You do what's right, you're going to be spared. President Ezra Taft Benson talks about the influence of what scriptures can do. He reads the scriptures and wants to act on them. He wants to act and do what he's supposed to be doing. President Benson says, this is what happens when you read the scriptures, how it influences you and those around you. Often we spend great effort trying to increase the activity levels in our stakes. We work diligently to raise the percentages of those attending sacrament meetings. We labor to get a higher percentage of our young men on missions. We strive to improve the numbers of those marrying in the temple. All these are commendable efforts and important to the growth of the kingdom. But when individual members and families immerse themselves in the scriptures regularly and consistently, these other areas of activity will automatically come. Testimonies will increase. Commitment will be strengthened. Families will be fortified. Personal revelation will flow. And I also like, this is a few years ago, but Elder L. Lionel Kendrick said this, The scriptures should be of the greatest importance in our lives. Our spiritual survival during the stresses of our society and the temptations of our time is greatly dependent upon the strength we will receive from searching the scriptures and listening to the words of the prophets, seers, and revelators. People as well as nations perish without scriptures. The scriptures are spiritual food for our spirits, just as are as important as physical food for our bodies. And there's been emphasis today just on scriptures with those that don't read it in the, in the Kings and those that pay attention to it and act on it. And, you know, my guess is if you're, if you're actually watching this, you got it all the way through, you are studying the scriptures. I commend you. I think it's awesome. And we have an age of digital interruptions. What do you do to stay focused on your study of the scriptures and minimize interruptions? I mean, I think that's probably one of the things that I used to have different questions that I would read about studying the scriptures. But I've learned as I've watched teenagers study scriptures, and as they're in class and they're studying for a couple minutes, it's amazing the number of little dings they get, highlights and notes and alerts and texts that interrupts their study. And you know, just think about somebody that you know who really studies and loves the scriptures. What effect has scripture study had on their lives? And what helps you to receive revelation as you study the scriptures? That's just my thought, the questions on scriptures. Now, there's a list that's in here, how to get your life back in order. And I'm just going to summarize. In chapter 23, he goes to the temple. They get rid of the idols. They get rid of things that are harming the family. I know in this context, I'm, I don't want to say I'm stretching it, but don't cause your children to pass through the fire you know, to an idol. But you generalize it. You know, if you want to get your life back in order, quit doing the things that may harm or influence negatively your family. And you have to replace things that are wicked with something important. It's not just simply getting rid of it, but you have to replace it with something important. And for them, they had, well, sepulchers to false priests, and they're kind of like, hey, these were the people who got us worshiping false religions. And the king gets rid of it. Maybe it's a generalization. If there's something that's a, that's a monument to sin, get rid of it. Photo on your wall that's like, ah, yeah, that's probably not reminding me to do what's right. Get rid of it. Keep the Passover for them, which points towards Christ, or keep the sacrament 
which points us to Christ, back to Christ, and remember him today. And chapter 23, also act on the words of prophets. And then I just love the last words, the encouragement, to turn to the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might. Well, chapter 24, Jerusalem, later on is besieged and taken, cap by, taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar. Many of the people of Judah are carried captive to Babylon. Zedekiah becomes king of Jerusalem and he rebels against Babylon. That eh, doesn't work out. Nebuchadnezzar again besieges Jerusalem in chapter 25. Zedekiah is captured. Jerusalem and the temple are destroyed. And most of the people of Judah are carried into Babylon. Gedaniah, left to govern the remnant, is slain. The remnant flee to Egypt. Jehoiakim is shown favor in Babylon. Now, in these chapters, Jerusalem is destroyed and Jew, people of Judah are brought into captivity. It's about 600 B.C. And don't forget, one of Zedekiah's sons, his name's Mulek, escapes the destruction of Jerusalem. The Lord directs Mulek and others to the Promised Land in the Americas. Sometime it's after Lehi and his family had left Jerusalem. Some of Lehi's descendants found the descendants of Mulek and joined with them in Zarahemla. Now just some teaching thoughts. I, I think, for me, there's a lot of history in here, and I probably covered more than that than I probably wanted to. But the focus here is the impact that the study of scriptures have on an individual, on their family, and on a society. And for them, the impact of the scriptures removed wickedness from them. So maybe that teaching thought is, how does the study of scriptures inspire you to stop doing something? And two, how will your studies of the scripture inspire you to start doing something or continue doing something because when you read Revelation it invites Revelation into your hearts and your minds and number three like these individuals who are growing up in a, in a uh, wicked society how will you make a difference today or this week to help others be inspired and inspiring and if I could just have one suggestion encourage them to read the scriptures because as they read Revelation It'll invite revelation into their hearts and their minds. Hey, thank you so much for spending some time with me today. I hope you have a lovely day. Keep smiling.